Hello, everyone. I greet you with the salutation of peace. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Rada Khan, and I'm the executive director of American Muslim Health Professionals. Back to school is usually a highly anticipated time met with much excitement, especially now with most students going back to attending school in person after having gone through social isolation and virtual learning for such a long time due to the COVID-19 pandemic. But we're seeing that vaccination rates among teens and young adults are still not at optimal level, and even lower among young people of color. News of increases in COVID-19 cases and hospitalization around the country due to the Delta variant, even among children, has left parents, teachers, and students with many questions. Well, we're here today to address these concerns and questions that we've gathered from all the communities that we serve, particularly the Muslim community. Today, American Muslim Health Professionals, or AMHP, and the Islamic Food and Nutrition Council of America, or IFANCA, in partnership with over 50 organizations, are thrilled to have with us Dr. Anthony Fauci to address these questions. Dr. Fauci is a world-renowned immunologist who is serving as the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and is the chief medical advisor to the president. Welcome, Dr. Fauci, and thank you for joining us. It's indeed an honor to have you join us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, I'm pleased to also introduce you to the youth vaccine champions who will be addressing the questions to Dr. Fauci. Today, we have with us Mikhail Martinez Jaca, who is a Latino, Indigenous, and South Asian community organizer who's helped organize COVID-19 vaccinations for over 10,000 people. He's a computer science major, a messenger of peace, and also an Eagle Scout. We also have with us Sela Marine, who is part of the Johns Hopkins University and AMHP, AMHP <clears throat> Ambassador Program, and is majoring in molecular and cellular biology with a minor in Islamic studies. She's also founded a tutoring service at the start of the pandemic. Hassan Bacharouch is also a vaccine advocate and an incoming junior at Fortson High School in Dearborn, Michigan, who plans to study biomedical engineering and work in the health tech industry. Last but not least, we have Zainab Jimmo, who is also part of the Johns Hopkins University and MHP Vaccine Ambassador Program, and has just recently earned her bachelor's in public health with a minor in Islamic studies. She's an advocate for underserved communities with a special focus on mental health among, among Black Muslims. To start us off, Dr. Fauci, I'm going to ask the first question, but then I'm going to give it to the vaccine ambassadors to take it from there. So, Dr. Fauci, with the backdrop of misinformation about COVID-19, the Delta variant and bre breakthrough infections have caused quite a stir. Can you briefly tell us more about why this variant is more infectious and how that impacts safety measures taking place? Well, the, the Delta variant is more infectious. It transmits much, much more readily than the Alpha variant or any other preceding variants that we had to deal with. The reason is that when someone gets infected with the Delta variant, the viral load that you can determine from the nasopharynx is about a thousand times higher than the viral load in the nasopharynx of someone who is infected, for example, with the Alpha variant. So that's a mechanistic reason why it's much more highly transmissible. Another important fact regarding the Delta variant is that even if you are vaccinated, which actually does protect you quite well against infection, even with the Delta variant, not as well as it protects against the Alpha variant, but it still protects you very well 
against severe disease leading to hospitalization and death. However, what we are seeing now is that in the inevitable breakthrough infections that will occur, because no vaccine is 100% effective, that unlike the alpha variant, if you are vaccinated and get the unusual breakthrough infection with a Delta variant, the level of virus in your nasopharynx is similar to the level of an unvaccinated person who's infected, which means that unlike the alpha variant, if you're infected and get a breakthrough, excuse me, if you're vaccinated and get a breakthrough infection, you are quite capable of transmitting that infection, even if you have no symptoms or minimal symptoms, you're quite capable of transmitting that infection to someone else. This was not the case with the alpha variant. If you were vaccinated and got infected with the alpha variant, the level of virus in your nasopharynx was so low that it was very unlikely that you would transmit it. However, we're seeing that that's not the case with Delta, and people who are vaccinated with a breakthrough infection can transmit it to others. Dr. Fauci, thank you again for being here uh, to interact with the community and inform us all on this important medical information. Again, my name is Mikhail Martinez Jaka. I'm a college student at Northern Virginia Community College and an Eagle Scout at the All Dulles Area Muslim Society. Uh, so uh, the question, one of the questions I have for you is, with the surge of the Delta variant, as well as breakthrough infections that you mentioned, in certain hotspots, many college students and parents are anxious and have many questions about in-person attendance this semester. For example, is it reasonable to send vaccinated students to school while keeping those who are unvaccinated at home? And at what level of cases and transmission in a school would it become inadvisable for the students attending in person to be there at the college campus? Well, at the college level, we feel, and even at the elementary school level, we feel that given the deleterious effects on children from a psychological, mental health, and developmental standpoint of keeping them out of school physically is really something that you want to avoid, which is the reason why in schools lower level than college, we want to get people safely back to school by vaccinating those people in the school system who will be surrounding the children, teachers, faculty, as well as other employees of the school system. And to make matters even more safe, masks should be wear, worn, in particularly in areas of the country with a high level of transmission. At the college level, Mikhail, what I think you're starting to see more and more is you're going to be seeing mask mandates. In other words, many colleges and universities either have already done so or will soon do so, particularly now that the vaccine has been fully approved, at least the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna soon to follow, that it's going to be a requirement for physical presence in the college to get vaccinated. I believe that's a good thing because we really want to keep the, the schools, even at the college and university level, safe. So vaccination is going to be the answer to your first question, even if it has to be mandated. The critical point that you mentioned is that when do you reach a level of transmission that you have to modify and maybe discontinue in-person classes? Well, that's one of the things you'll have to, there's no magic number there, Mikhail, but if you start to see a considerable number of people getting infected and spreading it throughout the campus, if you're in college, then I think at that point, you'd have to rethink your strategy, but there's no magic number to that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fauci.
And again, my name is Sela Marin. I'm a vaccine ambassador with AMHP and the Johns Hopkins University Department in Islamic Studies. My question for you is, school staff are already spread too thin across the United States, and it's difficult to monitor and enforce masking and social distancing during mealtimes, breaks, and sports, and not all of these activities can be done outdoors. Additionally, bus rides have also been cited as a concern. So with the Delta variant being more contagious, what does that mean for these activities? And how can schools be supported so they can better monitor masking and other safety measures? Well, I think you put your finger on an important problem. We have to do much better in monitoring the wearing of masks, but you wanna break down into the level of students. If you're talking 12 years old and older, I would encourage the parents of those children to really do whatever they can to get the children vaccinated because these vaccines are highly, highly effective and are very safe. So when you're talking about 12 and older, vaccine is a major tool that should be utilized and implemented. Younger than 12, 11 and younger, we are likely not going to get vaccines for them until the mid to late fall and early winter. That being the case, I think the point that you mentioned about striving and encouraging people to get people, children and faculty to wear masks and to monitor that as best as you possibly can. One of the other things you can do is to make sure that the eligible people to be vaccinated, be they teachers, school personnel who are supporting the school, athletic coaches, bus drivers, anyone that comes into contact with children who are too young to be vaccinated should be vaccinated, highly encouraged and perhaps even mandated. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Fauci. Good afternoon. My, uh, thank you very much for being with us. My name is Hassan Basharoush. I am a junior at Fortson High School in Dearborn, Michigan. My question for you is, at this time, the CDC advises schools to protect children below the age of 12 by masking, testing, and ensuring all teachers and school staff are vaccinated. Should schools then be mandating vaccines for all their employees in order to protect the children under their care? If schools don't mandate vaccines for employees, what other measures can be put into place? That's a very good question. And I have been and still am very much now that we are in a very difficult situation with having a surge of infections, the entire country with few exceptions, being in the red or orange zone of transmission, I am very much in favor of mandating vaccines for faculty in the schools and people who are in the school system, be they support staff or what have you. For those who are not vaccinated or can't be vaccinated or you can't implement a mandate, I would require intermittent testing for those individuals to show that they're not bringing infection in the school. It's very important to provide a safe environment to allow our children to be able to participate in school physically present in the classroom because we know of the deleterious effects of keeping children out of physical presence in the school. Psychological, mental, and developmental issues are very important. Thank you. Thank you so much for your insight, Dr. Fauci. My name is Zainab Gmo, and I'm a recent college graduate from Johns Hopkins University, and I currently serve as a vaccine ambassador for AMHP. My question for you is that some parents and college students are worried about the long-term impact of COVID-19 infections on children and young adults. Can you talk about what the current research says about long-term effects of being infected with COVID-19? There is unquestionably a syndrome called what people call colloquially long COVID, but it really is a post-acute COVID symptoms. And we know now that it is a real phenomenon. A number of studies have ongoing showing that anywhere from 10 to 30% of people who have COVID-19 and recover have a constellation of signs and symptoms that include profound fatigue, 
muscle aches, temperature dysregulation, tachycardia, uh, sleep disturbances, and something called brain fog, which means they have a difficulty in focusing or concentrating for any extended period of time. At the NIH, together with the CDC, we're doing a very extensive cohort study to try and find what the underlying pathogenic mechanism of this phenomenon, which is very real, very puzzling, and very frustrating. But in order to be able to do anything about it, we have to understand what the underlying pathogenic mechanisms are. The NIH is very deeply involved in doing this at multiple institute levels. So hopefully as time goes on, we'll get more insight into this perplexing syndrome and be able to do something about it. Thank you. Thank you for that. I do have a second question here. So the administration has announced a plan for booster shots for adults starting eight months after they receive their second dose of an mRNA vaccine, such as the Pfizer, BioNTech, or Moderna. How do children aged 12 to 17 fit under this plan? Will they, get a will they get a booster shot after eight months as well? What role will schools play in booster shots given that students who receive their vaccination as part of the back to school efforts will hit their eight month mark while in school? Well, children from 12 to 16 uh, will not be able to yet, but the data are going to be submitted to the FDA for safety and other considerations to see if in fact, and I ultimately believe that they will be eligible to be able to get boosted once the data are looked at by the FDA and the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices makes a recommendation to the CDC. But you're absolutely correct. Starting the week of September the 20th, uh, individuals starting from those who got their vaccinations very early on in January, and that's mostly the elderly, people in long-term care facilities, and healthcare providers. Thank you very much, Dr. Fauci. Uh, my next question for you is, misinformation about the impact of the vaccine has served as a barrier to vaccine uptake, especially among the young. To name a few, uh, infertility, DNA alteration, and magnetism. Uh, can you speak to the actual common side effects of the vaccine, the fears that are created by this misinformation, and how we can best address this? Yes, there is a considerable amount of misinformation and disinformation, particularly on social media. The things you said, vaccines cause infertility, they don't. Vaccines cause you to be magnetic, it doesn't. Vaccines is an implant to follow you around and monitor you, ridiculous nonsense. The best way to counter misinformation and disinformation is to flood the system with correct information, which is the reason why it's so important to be doing the things that you and I are doing right now, is to ask those questions and answer them with correct information. But you're absolutely correct. One of the biggest detriments to good public health practices is misinformation. And unfortunately, in this arena of social media, you have a few, relatively speaking, people who are driving the misinformation campaign. Thank you, Dr. Fauci, uh, for that important information. Uh, my second question for you is about youth vaccine advocates. Uh, over the past uh, year and a half plus of the pandemic, youth have been instrumental uh, to community vaccination efforts across the country. However, many of these dedicated youth often face additional barriers when working with individuals who are older or in positions of authority, even within their own communities and organizations. What advice would you give to youth vaccine advocates as they navigate these efforts and their ability uh, to positively influence the health of their communities? Well, first of all, I would like to congratulate the youth advocates who are doing this because they're doing something that's extremely important by being an advocate for vaccine. And, you know, there are obstacles to a lot of good things we want to do in life. The one thing you want to encourage the youth is don't get discouraged by the obstacles. Most obstacles are surmountable. There are very few insurmountable obstacles. It may not be easy, but you got to figure a way around it. Don't give up on your advocacy. Just keep plugging along. A lot of times you're doing things that people get in the way of. 
But if you give up right away, you will have they will have won and you will have been defeated. Don't be defeated. Just keep pushing along because your cause is a very noble cause. You're trying to get people to be vaccinated, which means you're trying to save their lives. Thank you very much, Dr. Fauci. I think that's definitely something we all needed to hear. Um, my final question for you is uh, vaccine ingredients have always been a source of controversy when it comes to vaccine uptake and COVID-19 vaccines are no exception. Concerns about the use of ingredients such as fetal cells, pork products, and eggs have all dominated the COVID-19 vaccine dialogue. How do these concerns factor into the initial stages of vaccine development and promotion? And what are the lessons learned here? Well, I think the lessons learned are you be very transparent in what and how the vaccines were made. I mean, the process of the mRNA vaccine is a very simple molecular process, which is, you know, highly transparent. You know from your work, I'm sure, at Hopkins, that mRNA just codes for a protein. The protein is a very, very well understood, recognized spike protein, which binds to the ACE2 receptor. There's nothing mysterious about that. There are no chips in there. There are no things in there that are going to give you any problem. So it's just a matter of transparency and continuing to talk about the facts. Thank you for that. Um, my final question for you is that um, with COVID-19 startling toll on minorities, has with COVID-19 startling toll on minorities, which has once again highlighting long-standing health inequities driven by structural racism, it is no surprise then that mistrust of the medical and scientific community has factored into the conversation on vaccines creating a gap between the science and social dialogue surrounding the pandemic. The role that scientists from minority communities have played in the development of the vaccine, such as Dr. Orgur Shaheen and his wife, Dr. Uslan Torasi, or Kizmekia Corve, can address this issue. How can leading health institutions amplify the role of minority scientists so that the youth who are working to, add, to address inequities can see value in pursuing STEM areas as a means to bridging this divide? Well, I think you said it right there at the end. We've got to encourage people like yourselves and my good colleague and friend, Kizmekia Kobe, to continue to do what they do and encourage young minorities, African-Americans, Hispanics, and others to get involved in science, to be able to show the example of the credibility of the scientific process among minorities. I agree with you completely, and I talk about this very frequently, that the increase in infection and the increase in the severe outcomes seen among African-Americans is not an accident. It is as a result of the social determinants of health that have been there for decades, if not centuries, fundamentally based in the racism that society has really shown over the last centuries in this country. It's not gonna turn around overnight, but perhaps the dramatic difference and disproportionate suffering that minorities, particularly African-Americans have experienced with COVID-19 will give us the impetus to once and for all take seriously and address these social determinants of health and hit them head on because they're not gonna go away spontaneously. We're gonna have to make them disappear. So perhaps this will be a good lesson as the years go on. Thank you. Well, on behalf of AMHP and Ifanka, we would like to thank you, Dr. Fauci, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to answer our questions today. And we're all very grateful to our vaccine champ champions for the work that they're doing to keep our, our communities safe. Our vaccine e outreach efforts stem from our commitment to human rights, which is a central concept within our faith. And our goal is to address vaccine equity and access within all underserved communities. We're especially keen on making sure that the nuances, needs, and concerns of the Muslim community are also voiced, acknowledged, and addressed. So thank you again for, for joining us, Dr. Fauci. With that being said, our research partners at the Institute of Social Policy and Understanding have just this morning shared some findings from their national survey of American Muslims and the American general public, indicating that American Muslims uh, are more likely to express vaccine hesitancy than the general public, which speaks to the need for us to once again, continue to have these conversations. 
Before I hand the rest of um, the program over to our board president, Dr. Hassan Chenawani, I would like to take this moment to thank all our 50 plus community partners and give a special thanks to our event sponsors, which include the Islamic Networks Group, the Next Wave Muslim Initiative, Santurna Capital, Nexus Pharmaceuticals, Care Venture Capital, and Amana Mutual Fund Trust. Thank you, Dr. Fauci. Thank um, you. It's good to be with you. Thank you for having me. Ifanka will be joining us through a pre-recorded video presentation that they had prepared for us so that they can speak to their work on vaccine equity within the American community, but also within the uh, global community as a whole. No one said it would be easy. Delivering 2 billion vaccines to the world? COVID is still spreading and new strains are making the news. So we're not stopping. Together, we've reached over 130 countries so far, but we've got billions of doses to go because no one is safe until we're all safe. My name is Asma Ahad and I'm the Director of Halal Market Development for the Islamic Food and Nutrition Council of America. Before the terms food insecurity and health insecurity were ever mainstream ideas, the Islamic Food and Nutrition Council of America made it its mission to address these concerns. You may have heard of us as one of the world's leading halal certifying bodies, but our mission and purpose encompasses far more than that. Founded in 1982, our core mission is to address the needs of halal consumers. This includes enabling access to halal products so halal consumers could feel food and health secure while simultaneously preserving their core religious values. How do we do this? On staff, we have esteemed religious scholars as well as scientific experts and a, and a plethora of experience. And over time, we've established ourselves as a global thought leader in halal. For example, Countries like Malaysia and Indonesia count on Ifanka to help them meet their stringent import requirements for halal. Additionally, world-class companies work with Ifanka to administer their halal compliance programs. Organizations like UNICEF and the American Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics work with Ifanka and partner with them to meet the needs of all people, not just halal consumers. The COVID-19 pandemic has cost millions of lives and has impacted billions more and continues to put all of humanity at risk. In response, Ifanka has partnered with UNICEF in its historic effort to procure and distribute COVID-19 vaccinations. Additionally, and equally as important, Ifanka is partnering with UNICEF to combat misinformation and support major health systems to deliver vaccinations. Our scientific and religious experts, as well as our global partners, are in resounding agreement that COVID-19 vaccines are imperative for the health security of the global population. Supporting vaccinations and combating misinformation is at the core of our mission. Please join us in this very important effort. We look forward to hearing from you and we look forward to your support. Please email us at contact at ifancacares.org with your ideas, your partnerships, and your resources. Your actions and your advocacy can help us achieve this very important mission. Thank you. And thanks to our co-sponsors at uh, IFANCA. Uh, IFANCA, of course, uh, is a nonprofit organization based in Illinois, uh, founded in, in, in the 1980s. Its primary mission has been to promote halal, which is the allowable uh, foods um, that Muslims eat and is part of healthy uh, eating. This involves helping Muslim consumers meet their needs with a variety of considerations, include, as was just stated, food security, health security, and uh, nutrition equity. Ifanka works with a team of Islamic scholars, scientists, and industry experts to do their work. Um, we're proud to co-sponsor this event with Ifanka, which is a trusted organization on all halal matters related to food, nutrition, and pharmaceutical products. Thanks to Ifanka.
I'm very excited. Uh, first, let me, uh, before introducing our next guest, to say thank you to Dr. Fauci and to our vaccine ambassadors for the work you're doing around the country uh, to serve the health needs of Americans uh, all over our nation. Uh, we're still not done with this fight against this pandemic, and I'm so proud to be part of this work. I'm especially excited to introduce to, uh, to you our next speaker, um, Imam uh, Makram Al-Amin. Uh, Imam Al-Amin has been a health leader and community service member uh, in the Minneapolis area for 25 years. He serves as the executive director uh, of Al Ma'un. Uh, Ma'un is an important verse in the Quran that speaks to the needs of, uh, of uh, our neighbors and, and, the, and the, the underserved. And Ma'un is uh, the mosque's community outreach organization in the Twin Cities. Uh, Dr. Makram's work touches on issues of cross-cultural understanding, home ownership, immigration reform, and civic engagement. Since the pandemic started, Ed Ma'un has served over 100,000 meals, distribute, distributed hundreds of thousands of pounds of produce and shelf-stable items, and has dispersed PPE, personal uh, protective equipment, throughout Minneapolis and the Twin Cities. Dr. Uh, Imam Makram has also been working on addressing vaccine hesitancy in the community that he serves. Very important, as Dr. Khan just said, a new report came out just this morning showing that vaccine hesitancy with the Muslim community in general, and especially in the African-American Muslim community in particular, remains high and it remains an important challenge for those of us trying to encourage vaccination and good health. Um, Imam Makram, great to have you here with us, with us today. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Uh, Dr. Hassan, it's very um, a very pleasure of mine to be here. I am excited to be a part of this conversation for this very important topic um, and, and timely during the, the Delta variant and all this happening in our country right now. Imam Makram, let me start with this first question. You've been serving in the community for over 20 years now, and we still have this immense struggle with, with, with hesitancy. The public health and medical community that AMHP works with cannot mobilize people around promoting vaccines when we're still struggling to build trust or address the skepticism existing within underserved communities and communities in culture of, yeah. co of, of color. This is obviously not a quick fix. Can yeah. you speak from your experience to the roots of this and your community's experience and concerns about, and specifically about vaccine promotion, but also with children going back to school and how has that work been going on in, in Minneapolis and the work in the community that I'm now and you do? Certainly, certainly. You know, I think it is important for us to step back and just look at the, uh, the the larger, wider context when we're thinking about this issue about vaccination that is pressing us today. You know, there's a history of mistrust, uh, and I think there was very well placed mistrust um, in the the medical community. Uh, things that have been promoted you know, from the side of governments and others, uh, particularly amongst uh, African American and Black communities uh, historically in this country, where we're talking about the Tuskegee experiment or other. Uh, things, even things like smallpox and other things. These things were um, gr great issues, great trials, but ma many of them were manufactured in ways that was uh, hurtful and harmful directly towards communities of color, particularly the African-American community was speaking, was speaking of Tuskegee uh, experiment specifically. However, um, I think that there is a moment right now that we need to recognize as we're looking at those things and in, in dealing with the issues of the COVID-19, the vaccines and on all this conversation that we're having, this is not a quick fix. It will not be a quick fix. And even with the work that we're doing here locally, trying to support people during, during this trying time uh, with all the things that you had just mentioned, but even the, the, the our communication and the way we engage people around this, this has to be uh, very nuanced in a way that is respectful of that historical trauma that our community has experienced, um, as well as keep the urgency of the day uh, right before us. So it is really a balancing act that we have to walk. Outstanding. And, and, and along those lines, speak to your role, if you don't mind, about in, as a faith leader, as, as, a, as, a, as a masjid leader, yeah. uh, in mosque community, doing community service. How can faith leaders uh, I'm, I'm a physician and I've worked in a number of institutions that unfortunately are guilty of failing in their professional obligations to earn that trust that you speak to uh, mm -hmm. and, and that need. Um, how can organizations like physicians like me, health professionals and facilities, but specifically how can faith leaders 
help in rebuilding the trust in the medical institutions. Not that the onus is upon them to build it, but how can they partner with us so that we can better serve those communities? You've been working on vaccine hesitancy for some time now and with neighboring communities. Can you give some experience and some examples perhaps? And, and just how are you navigating that process with the health institutions that you serve in, in, in Minneapolis? Certainly. You know, I think a, a couple of things I'd say. One is, you know, Muhammad the Prophet, peace be upon him, is recorded to have said that for every disease, there is a cure. For every disease, there is a cure. So the, the, the idea that there is something and, and a treatment that is out here to rid us of COVID-19 and any other uh, disease or ailment for that matter is firmly within our belief system. It's probably within than our idea of what is possible in human life. So we, we, we start there from a, a faith perspective, a basis that this is entirely possible and it's not something that uh, we have to really succumb to, uh, nor should we put our heads in the sand relative to the issue that we're facing today with COVID-19. You know, the other that I would say is, you know, there's, this Islam has this idea, as you're well aware, of uh, the idea of the, the collective responsibility. And there is a collective responsibility. And the that, thing, yeah. yeah, so the idea that, that, the idea that, you know, what's best for the group and, and, and in many cases supersedes what's best for the, the individual choice in a matter, right? Now, I know this is not a popular thing to say, and I, I'm, I'm saying that in full, uh, uh, you know, consciousness of that in this moment. Um, however, when you have an existential threat, uh, something like the, the Delta variant that is, uh, as Dr. Fauci just explained so articulately, how it, it's 1,000 times more effective here, all these kinds of, you know, statistics showing how much even it can break through even the current vaccinations that we have right now, then this is an existent, existential threat that is, that we're all subject to. And it really behooves us to move in a direction that will help the most of us, even if that means in some cases, uh, uh, rubbing up against you know, this individual freedoms. And I know that this is, again, not a popular thing to say. It is definitely one of those things that we, we, we struggle with, even within the conversation and discourse among many of my own personal community and my family, for that matter. But nonetheless, it's still a truth that we have to uphold um, as a Muslim. Absolutely, and outstanding. Along those lines, with, with your knowledge and expertise, it, it's a sad fact that physicians like myself, we are professionals, but at the end of the day, we are not well trained in public health messaging and community advocacy. This is becoming a new thing and a new need for, for us to, the need's always been there, but it's only one that we're only recently acknowledging. I want you to imagine for a moment that you have the ear of the public health and medical community. Like you're speaking to all of these doctors and public health experts. Yeah, Imam. And, 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 and what advice would you give us? What message would you wanna give them? What message would you like us, AMHP, to share with those people to share to when it comes to vaccine promotion efforts? And, and, and in your opinion, what kind of public health messages and messaging what might alleviate some of the skepticism that we're really struggling with as we yes. trust people? Absolutely. Again, the, the first thing that I think we, is we have to be truthful with the people. We have to be truthful with them. You know, the, the idea that uh, having transparency and clear communication. One of the most, uh, one of the biggest deterrents that I have come across in the work that we do day to day is seemingly the mixed messaging that comes through about, uh, about COVID-19. And not, not, not even about the misinformation. I mean, that's a whole nother area that we're going to discuss. But even from folks like the CDC and other folks as well, the idea of, you know, what should we do? Should we mask? Should we not mask? Is it okay to do this? And there's a lot of things to where people, it becomes almost that noise in, the, in people's minds. And they begin to take it less um, serious, quite frankly, right? So there's, a, there, there's that. There's also that. But also, you know, I would press the medical community and particularly the Muslims uh, that within the medical community to understand that this is this is going to be a long haul. That, but I think that our faith tradition calls us to be uh, truth tellers. Right. And it, it calls us to be uh, those folks who who champion the truth, but also with a particular uh, way of, of communicating to those who need to be communicated with. Muhammad the Prophet, peace be upon him, we know his model, his example, that he knew how to speak to the hearts and minds of people. And I think that communication 
uh, like any other, in any other sphere that we're in, the messengers matter. So I think that the idea of the medical community partnering with the faith community uh, and, and really helping to bridge that gap, I think is going to be very, very important. But again, it cannot be a, a marriage of convenience. It, it can't be something that happens just in the short term. This will just be more of the same. It has to be something that's really baked into um, you know, the, the, the mode of operation and how the medical community engages and, and likewise the faith community. You know, there's this idea, this myth about, you know, faith and science and being at odds with one another. That's a complete fallacy. I think that that's something that has to be spoken about um, and something to be uh, stood up as a model in, in Islam for Muslims particularly, but really for all people in general, that we can do this in a way that's effective. Uh, but, we, but we have to speak truth to people. And we have to have long-standing partnerships that's, that goes beyond the crisis that we find ourselves in today. Otherwise, the next crisis will bring us right back to this conversation again. Uh, again, a, a great reminder of the professional obligation that we as physicians and health professionals really need to bring to the table to really strengthen this, par this, this marriage, this partnership uh, sure. with the community, you know, to better serve the communities that we both serve, inshallah, God willing, together. Um, before I let you go, one last question. You, you heard, you saw these incredible individuals, these youth advocates. I mean, some as young as high school, early yeah. college, a recent college graduate. Um, first of all, just my heart just sings when I see these people, just seeing just what, you know, just how bright our future is. Yes. You know, for a minute you have their ear. What would your advice be to those youth advocates that are trying to tactfully manage and, and honestly, to, I mean, they are new to the struggles that you and I are talking about together right now, this history of structural racism and, and health inequity. Um, yes. and, and, and honestly, that, I mean, they, are, they, they have not seen many of them that hurt that so many people are suffering and they're seeing it honestly for the first time. Sure. What would your advice be to them as they go and serve these communities and at the same time respond to this urgency that you and I have been talking about for the last 10 minutes about as we serve these communities, families, and, and then, you know, just trying to keep themselves and their own families safe as they go back to school. What would your advice be to those advocates? Certainly. I, first, I want to commend each and every one of them for the outstanding work that they're doing to be uh, ambassadors, you know, for the, for the vaccine and really just for our community's health and well-being over and over, even beyond the vaccine, just about our health and wellness and us being okay um, as people. Um, but, but my advice to them uh, is just, first of all, to remind them that, much of the issues that they're coming up against right now preceded them, far preceded them. So this is not something that they have to take complete um, uh, onus or responsibility for, but everyone must do their part. Uh, so so I, I would encourage them to just do that, to do their part and understand when we think of from the prophetic um, messengers uh, that we've had in all of history and tradition of text, um, spiritually and religiously, you know, each of them, each of them, uh, came up against opposition. Each of them came up against pushback. They all faced, you know, those who were against them. I, I thought they were outright mad in terms of their, uh, intellectually, or or just just you know you know someone who was trying to pull the wool over someone else's eyes. That when you're working for something that is meaningful and that is really committed to good, a commitment beyond what is convenient, beyond what is monetary, beyond what is, you know, for, for notoriety or status, when you're committed to the good for, for good sake, then you will have opposition. And I think that if we look at it through that frame and through that paradigm, then the opposition that they will face, like many of us have faced working for good, is a good sign. It is a good sign that we are on the right path because if no one opposed you, if you had no pushback, if you had no uh, real opposition for the work that you're doing, then I, was, I would say that perhaps we need to question the work that we're doing. Perhaps we, maybe we're not as effective or not pushing the envelope as far as we possibly could. So uh, to my young people, I'm very proud of you. I, I, as an imam of a community for the last you know, quarter century, um, and, and working for, you know, the health and well, you know, wellness of, of all people that we serve. I, I'm just delighted. It makes my, it pleases my heart uh, and my mind and my soul and my spirit to see them working very diligently. And I, enc I encourage them to do more, uh, to push the envelope. Don't be afraid. Be bold and be courageous as you step into the next step of your work. 
And inshallah, we'll see 25 more years from you, Imam Makram. Barakallah. Amen. Uh, Amen. Inshallah, inshallah, may Allah bless you and your work. Every time I read Surah al Ma'un now, I'll be thinking about you and, and the great work. Alhamdulillah. Thank, Thank you so much for all your work and with, with uh, the, the work that you do to help to advocate for better health for our community. Thank you for all that you do. Barakallah fiqh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullah. I want to thank all of you for watching us today and, 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 and listening to us. AMHP continues to work hard on vaccine outrage to make sure that all Americans and our communities are safe and protected. We're especially keen on serving and advocating on behalf of Muslim American communities. AMHP is one of the founding members of the National Muslim Task Force on COVID-19, which will be releasing a joint statement with the National Black Muslim COVID Coalition addressing school uh, reopening. So be on the lookout for that. The MHP is also part of a number of national COVID vaccine working groups, including, but not limited to, the Made to Save Grassroots COVID-19 Vaccine Equity Group, the HHS Health and Human Services COVID-19 Community Core, the Global Health Crisis Coordination Center's Worship Action Coalition, Faiths for Vaccines, the COVID Health Coalition, and a number of more. We hope and ask and invite you to join us in this effort, to, with all of these efforts, to address the COVID-19 pandemic. Please, I hope that you check out our vaccine outreach website at amhp.us forward slash vaccine, where we have a number of resources on vaccination, including a vaccine sermon and chutbah guide uh, for imams and community leaders, as well as the various statements from the COVID-19 task force and vaccines, um, as well as the National Black Muslim COVID Coalition. We hope that you would sign up to be a vaccine advocate and join these in incredible individuals there are still opportunities to join that vaccine advocate community, and you can find the link as you can see it here on our vaccine website. We hope that you use the information that you learned here today to have open conversations with community members about how we can work together to keep everyone healthy and safe in the name of God, inshallah. Please be sure also to support the American Muslim Health Professionals, AMHP, um, with your time and money and follow us on social media at, at, the, uh, at the links that you saw before, as well as to receive up-to-date information on COVID vaccine and other important issues. On behalf of American Muslim health professionals, our co-sponsors, IFANCA, the National Muslim Task Force, and the rest of our sponsors, I wanted to say thank you so much. Jazakum Allah khair, may God bless you. Barakallah fikum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Mm -hmm.